Hello. Uh, welcome to the Parsons Communication Design Lecture Series for Fall 2023. Hello, everybody. Um, as you know, I'm Kelly Walters. I'm the program director for the BFA CD program, joined by Elaine Lopez, our associate director of BFA CD. Um, we're excited to bring these lectures back to being in person. Um, the CD lecture series allows CD students to meet design thinkers and practitioners within the discipline and adjacent fields. We are excited to return in-person lectures this semester and have an exciting lineup of scheduled uh, events on different dates and times to make it accessible for more students across the semester. You can learn more about our upcoming lecture from the CD app and watch past lectures from our YouTube channel. And our next lecture will be next week by Anushka Kandwala on Wednesday, September 27th at 9.30. I believe we're also in this room. So again, if you're in uh, a class that meets at that time, again, it really depends on if that's allowed with your faculty. But for the others, we've all kind of timed them to be aligned with your core class. Uh, but again, super excited to um, have you all join us. Bringing up Eugene Park. Hello everyone, my name is Eugene Park. I'm an associate um, professor of communication design here at Parsons. And I'm really proud today to welcome Sabrina Nagmias um, to the, uh, kick off the CD lecture series. Sabrina is a designer and educator working at the intersection of graphic and type design. She's a partner at FAIR Projects, a typography focused branding and digital design studio she co-founded in 2016. Through FAIR projects, Sabrina helps brands realize their vision from concept to launch. She's an alumna of Pratt Institute and the Type at Cooper Extended Typeface Education Program. At Parsons, she serves as a part-time faculty member, teaching classes revolving around the design and use of letter forms. Sabrina's self-driven practice explores how letter forms can be used for maximum impact in augmented reality, motion design, and notably, typeface design. In 2023, in collaboration with fellow type designer Maxime Gao, Sabrina officially launched her type design practice with the launch of their type foundry, Fair Type. Her typefaces have been used globally by brands, organizations, and institutions. In 2023, Sabrina received the TDC Ascenders Award, recognizing her impact on type design. So without further ado, let's welcome Sabrina. Thank you, Eugene, and thank you, Kelly and Elaine, for uh, inviting me to talk today. I am so excited to share my work with you all. Um, hopefully, you can hear me. I am uh, what si like the characters of Seinfeld would call a low talker, so I will do my best to project. Um, perfect. Okay, so today I'll be talking about building a type foundry. Does that help? <laughs> Um, our type foundry is called Fair Type, and we, uh, like Eugene said, we officially launched our work to the public in January of this year. Uh, but the process of building the type foundry took several years, and that's what I'd like to share with you today. So, what is Fair Type? Uh, Fair Type is the name of our foundry, and our design practice is called Fair Projects, and it made sense for us to call our type design practice Fair Type. The fair is pronounced uh, the same as fair in English, and in French, fair means to create, to make, to do, and uh, we also just really like the relation with the English word fair. So this little bit of Franglish feels aligned with our identities. So who are we? Um, fair type is the design practice of myself and my partner, Maxime Go. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn. Maxime is from Lyon in France, uh, but he now lives in Brooklyn. Um, too. So we like to say our focus is on crafting letter forms beautiful in form and versatile in function. And you can't forget the dog. <laughs> His name is Finn and uh, he's an Italian greyhound which is just a really interestingly shaped dog. Um, so how do we get started in type design? And the answer is graphic design. Uh, we've always had a typography focused design practice and that has fed our interest in type design. So I'd like to share a few short case studies of our graphic design work to share our approach. And the first project I'd like to share is the Bija Project, which is a socially minded organization promoting love, justice, and inclusivity through a radical approach to education and community building. And so they have a really amazing mission to their you know, project, and we designed their logo to be kind of as bold as their mission. 
And primarily the Beja Project was a school for children ages zero to four, but they held space for their community and molded into what their community needed them to be. So when we started to think about the brand system, we wanted to design an identity for them that emphasized who they are and that also included the space that they had available for outside ideas, new projects, that kind of thing. And because the school was centering itself around young children and their families, going with such a type-focused brand identity was a radical move in and of itself. In the top right, you can see how we're using type and language to showcase their message and who they are. And by just using type and color, we're able to communicate really powerfully. And here's how we built space into the logo for the different offerings that they have. And a fun thing we got to design was the t-shirt for the kids. So we went with these giant singular letters, which assembled would create Bija, which was a nice way to emphasize that Bija only exists when we come together. And from a practical standpoint, it also like made it easy for teachers and caregivers to gather kids into groups by having all the J t-shirts together, all the A's together. And so this, this is the next project I'd like to share. Um, it's the brand identity we made for Insanely Clean, which is a skincare brand created for young adults. And the brand is based in New York City, and we were inspired by kind of street art and the energy of the city. And we wanted to make a logotype that felt like street art on the bottle. So the identity is largely typographic and really focused on this um, really expressive logotype. But uh, we also created these stickers to highlight the different properties of the products. And as a secondary brand element, we created a digital graffiti inspired pattern that matches up to create a wall when you align the boxes. And then this next project, we worked with a new brand called People's Beauty, and their idea was to make skincare for everyone. So like basic skincare staples that work for most skin types in a design that doesn't feel like it's overly feminine or masculine, you know, whatever that may mean. Um, so with a name like People's Beauty, we wanted to create a logo that was really human. And we designed this custom script logotype, and then we built the rest of the brand around it. So here's the product lineup. And we kept the secondary typography really minimal to not compete with the logo. Uh, and for the color, we started to think about the question of when do people take care of their skin? And it's usually in the morning and at night. So we wanted to play with the idea of creating a little sunrise or sunset uh, in your bathroom cabinet. Now, if we zoom in on the type, there are some nice details in the logo. So because it's such a long name, there's a vertical version of the logo where the two words are stacked on top of each other. And then there's a horizontal version where it's all in one line. So in the stacked version, um, if we look at the descender of the P, it faces out to the left to balance the shape that kind of shoots out on the bottom of the S, uh, on the lowercase s on the other side. And in the horizontal version, the descender of the P faces inward to mirror what's happening on the lowercase y. So these are the kind of uh, design details that we get you know, really excited about or you know, interested in making. And then for this brand, we also drew some custom icons that have you know, like the same line thickness and character as the logo. So if it's not clear, really like logos. <laughs> um, we really enjoy the process of collaborating with people that are passionate about what they do. Uh, and then the challenge of trying to distill that passion into something that's purely typographic. So now I'll share some graphic design projects that are similar to the ones I just shared, but where we took it like one step further and built out a typeface. So this is for a brand called Mirlo, which is an artisanal soap brand based in Lyon, France. And making soap is a rigorous and traditional process in France. So we wanted the logo to embody the seriousness of the process, but also feel kind of playful with the light and floral quality, because it's you know soap after all. Um, so we designed this logo that's inspired by monospace letter forms, and we added special serifs that help it feel organic. And overall, we were searching for that balance between technical and handmade. And for the packaging, we kept the focus 
on the texture of the really nice paper stock that we used for the boxes and the typography. And we found something so interesting in the letter forms that came out of the logo exploration that we wound up developing them into the custom typeface for the brand. And because the brand identity was so typographically focused, having this unique typeface really helped us build the world of the brand identity. And so another little like fun, nerdy logo detail. Um, because of the organization of the letters, we decided not to have any serifs on the right side of the M. It just felt more balanced and worked better with the rest of the letters in the logo type. But for the shortened mark, we created a version with the M that has serifs on both sides. And here's the website. It has like a simple navigational structure. And you can see the custom typeface in action. And this is a project I worked on early on in my career. It was a branding project for a real estate consultancy in Southern California. Um, we built them this brand identity that was pretty corporate, but it matched the vibe and the kind of work that they do. Uh, but they had so many different branches in their consultancy that, uh, and they were always like kind of interested in creating more. So we built them uh, a custom typeface based on the logo type that we made uh, to help them maintain brand consistency across all the different things that they do. And so that way they didn't have to call us up when they needed to make a new logo for a new branch. <laughs> uh, and the last custom project I'd like to share is a fun one. We collaborated with designers from an agency called Elmwood to make this uh, custom typeface for Notel. And Notel is a, an office sharing space, kind of like a WeWork situation. And the designers that were doing the branding wanted to build out a custom display typeface that Notel could use in their office spaces and in their general brand identity. So we made this really geometric typeface, and uh, we have a lot of different alternates for maximum flexibility. So my partner, Maxime, and I had been working for several years at this point with a really typography-focused design practice. Uh, and we had also been drawing typefaces on the side, but never anything that we were too confident about. Uh, so we decided to apply to the Typer Cooper uh, extended program, and we were both accepted. And uh, so we were in the extended program at Typer Cooper, which is a year-long program designed for working professionals. Uh, class meets twice a week in the evenings, and there's a workshop one weekend a month. And it was just a really incredible experience. The other students in the program were so inspiring, and everyone was so open to share what they knew, and it was just a really supportive and fun environment to be in. It was also my first time back in a classroom in years, uh, and it reminded me how much I love it. Uh, our class spent time exploring the archives and the libraries at the Cooper Union, and we also took field trips to Columbia University and to Providence, Rhode Island to look at type. It was just really fun to spend a full year dedicated to letters. And at the end of that experience, Maxime and I were like, OK, we want to start a type foundry. How? So we took it step by step. Um, the first step for us seemed to be like build a type catalog. So um, after Type of Cooper, we had a bunch of type that we'd worked on during the program. Uh, and also before the program, and we had to make some choices because from a purely logistical standpoint, it takes a really long time to finish a typeface. Uh, but we also wanted to make sure that our, when we launched, our catalog felt like it represented our artistic vision for our foundry. Uh, so n not necessarily including every typeface that we could, but really making some curated design choices about what type we wanted to include. So we wound up selecting these four typefaces. Uh, to us, they felt strong, really usable, and also they each had a special quality. And in our own work, we had been able to use each of these typefaces, and we had shared them with our friends, and we were generally happy with the overall look and feel we were getting from using them. And then in the process of working on those four, uh, two new typefaces formed. And now we're going to take a side quest to make a typeface real quick. So we're gonna, uh, I'm going to talk you through the process of making Sprig uh, and Sprig Sans. 
So the story of Sprig starts in Rome in a used bookstore where I found this book called Collecting Old Lusterware. It was printed in 1916. Here's a high-res scan. Um, and I wanted to share some details of the type that I was drawn to. So I really love the lowercase letter G. It has this nice like, open counter at the bottom that ends in a little teardrop terminal. And I really liked the overall feeling of roundness that was present in the letter forms and just all the nice details that I was seeing. And then there were just so many weird, funky details. So uh, the A senders and the capital letters were so much bigger than the X height, which you can, I've, I've listed out kind of what I'm talking about here, um, that the capital letters looked like it was almost from a different, a bigger font size. And the dot of the I soars so high above the stem of the I, it's just like flying up there. So we've got this very low X height, these very tall A senders, and then the D senders are like super short, little teeny tiny. Uh, and then there are other fun details. So there's like, and this is printed in 1916. There's several ligatures that are just really cool. The, the FF in Staffordshire is one of my favorites. Uh, and then the lowercase r in the whole typeface rises above the X height to like give its neighbor a hug. So I digitized the typeface, and I tried to remain pretty faithful to the source material, and I was happy with it. I considered it a success. Uh, but as time went on, I worked on the typeface on and off uh, for, for over three years. Uh, and I learned more about the origin of the typeface that was in my source material. So it was either a cut of Cheltenham or a knockoff of Cheltenham. And during the early 1900s, Cheltenham, which is what you're looking at here, um, these are spreads from the specimen pages uh, in the American Type Founders catalog from 1923. Uh, Cheltenham was just so popular. It was originally drawn by Bertram Governor Grosvenor Goodhue as part of a commission for, the, for a New York City printing press. And then it was patented, bought by ATF, where Morris Fuller Benton turned it into the world's first full-fledged large type family by expanding the original design to include italics, several weights, display styles, um, you name it, they made it. And because it was so popular, it was imported or copied by like a lot of foundries, either locally or globally, um, both when it was created and in the years since. So I'm not the first type designer who wanted to take a crack at remaking the letter forms that Goodhue designed. Here are some foundries that had made um, kind of their own versions. And this is all from the early, early 1900s. And then over time, while I was using the typeface uh, that I had drawn in my own work, I started to make big and small adjustments every time I would use it. And ultimately, my commitment to the source material went out the window. <laughs> A big part of it, too, is that the source material was um, printed at 10-point type, and it looked really good at that size, but I wanted something that was flexible and really usable at all sizes. So I started to make some design decisions. Um, I started to sharpen the edges, maintaining the roundness in the letters only where it felt like it was really serving the design. And I remodeled the proportions to be a little bit more geometric. I also raised the X height to make it more legible. And when I was finally confident about it, I expanded the typeface into eight weights and made the matching italics. And when it came time to make the italics, I used the source material as a reference, but I didn't worry about being super faithful to it the way I was when I was making the Roman. I wanted to be more sure that the italic styles worked well with the Roman that I had already drawn than to you know, just be a perfect replica of the source material. So here you can see uh, how they're similar and how they're different. The source material is on the left, and my final italic is on the right. Now, almost all typefaces have open type features. So open type features are coded into a typeface, and you can use these features to access alternate design characters, ligatures, swashes, like special number features, like fractions. Um, so I wanted to use open type features in Sprig to pay homage to some of the original weird characters and details that I loved from my source material, but that didn't feel versatile enough to be the, the default characters. So you can access some of those like interesting characters and turn it on and 
have a, a little bit of a weirder version of the font. And since I had been working on this typeface over the course of several years, I'd see things in my daily life and in my research that I'd take note of. So I really love the swashes and more decorative forms from these references, and I thought that they'd work really well with Sprig. So I made a series of swashes and ligatures for both the italic and the Roman. And here you can see Sprig hairline italic with some of those special features. And after spending so long with the letter forms, I kind of didn't want to let it go. So I, I love the proportions and the feel of the typeface, and I wanted to see what would happen if I made it into a grotesque sans serif. So this is Sprig Sans. Uh, it maintains the same proportions as Sprig's, and it keeps the kind of special open counter G that I really loved. Uh, and overall, it just has a nice roundness to the letters and to the details. OK, back to the catalog. So we made the type. Here we are. Next step, variable fonts. Um, so we knew we wanted to have variable fonts to be part of our catalog, part of our you know, brand. There are so many benefits to variable fonts. An obvious one is the file size. So instead of having 16 files that all together weigh one and a half megabytes, you just have one file that has all your styles inside of it, and it weighs just 250 kilobytes. So if you think about for the web or um, even for your own computer, it saves a lot of space. And there's also a lot of really nice animation possibilities with variable fonts. So you can easily animate your text either with traditional animation software like After Effects or with code. And in code, the animations can be done with just like a few lines of lightweight CSS or basic JavaScript. So here's a really like a simple, useful way that variable fonts can be used as a hover state with Sprig Sans. And variable fonts were also intrinsically linked in our design process. When we were designing Luma, which grew from our Mueller project, if you remember a few slides back, um, we were designing this and asked ourselves, what's the most special part of this design, and what would happen if we amplified it? So we grew the serifs, and then we, came, we got to Luma Reverse. And we really loved both ends of the spectrum, but we also found the space in between to be really interesting. And we wanted to make sure that that space in between was accessible. And the only way to get it is through the variable fonts. OK, so we got our, variable we got our fonts, we got our variable fonts, and now we have to figure out how to sell them. And I'm going to ask you all to bear with me as we get into the nerdy world of font licensing. <laughs> um, so surprising no one, font licensing is complicated. Um, but basically, when you buy a font, you aren't actually buying the font. You're buying the license to use that font under a specific set of circumstances that you agree to when you make your purchase. Uh, and there are a lot of different licenses that can exist for fonts, and every foundry does it their own way. Uh, but what's on this page should give you a pretty good idea of the options available if you're licensing a font. Uh, and then within these options, someone licensing the font will also probably need to know how many followers they have if they want to use the font on social media or how many people visit their website per month. And that seems really complicated to us. And as designers on the other end, you know, graphic designers going to other foundries, we had always struggled with this complexity whenever we were licensing fonts. So um, we decided to keep it simple and go with these three license types desktop, web, and app. And the reason we have just these three is it represents the three different ways you can work with font software. So you can install desktop fonts on a computer. You host web fonts on a server for a dom to serve a domain. And you embed app fonts in an app. But we still found the subcategories of licensing confusing. Um, if a new startup is launching their website, how can they predict how many visitors will come to their website per month? And then if they guess wrong, do they have to pay more? Um, even for desktop fonts, knowing the number of computers that the font is going to be installed on isn't always the metric that it's most accurate in gauging how much it should cost. 
So we talked to a lot of foundries and ultimately we were really inspired by our friends at ABC Dynamo and decided to follow their model of pricing, pricing by size of the company. So this seemed the most fair to us and I can give you an example that sums it up. Um, if we're thinking about a nonprofit that let's say has 12 employees, all these employees are probably wearing multiple hats. Um, they all probably need access to the font so they can update their documents and presentations because everybody's contributing. But if we imagine a 200 person enterprise, they're probably gonna have a design team and maybe they'll have a three person design team that makes all the visuals for the company. So if we're pricing just based on how many people use the fonts, the small nonprofit would wind up paying more while the large company would pay less. So this system of pricing based on the size of the company is what seems the most fair to us. And um, we also made a decision that if you're a designer working for a company, uh, you shouldn't have to buy our fonts to do your job. That the company buys the license for the fonts, they're getting the benefits because they're getting, um, you know, they're using them in their project that's going out to the world. You're covered under the, under the company's license. You're covered under your client's license. You can freely put it in your portfolio and not worry about it. The only time a designer would need to purchase fonts from us is if they're using our fonts for their personal project. Okay, so we've got our fonts, our variable fonts, and our foundry ethics in line. Uh, we know how we want to sell our fonts. So the next step for us was to write an end user licensing agreement, which is uh, something that you agree to by simply using software. Um, in this case, it's our fonts. It's the guidebook on what's allowed and what's not allowed. And I'm sure you all can imagine that there are not many lawyers that are well versed in font licensing. Uh, so I wound up taking some EULA workshops from another foundry owner who'd spent a lot of time thinking about the EULA, and I read every EULA that I could find, and I got to work on ours. So I have my typefaces, the font files are good to go, they're engineered, we have variable fonts, um, our licensing structure is set, the EULA is written. The next step, design the website. Figma. So I started designing the website in January of 2022, and we launched in January 2023. So it was a full year uh, long process. And the site was incredibly complex to design and build be because of all the features that we wanted to include. And at the same time as designing the website, we were also designing the identity for our foundry. As you know, we love logos. So we wanted to build an identity that showcased our love of letter forms. So instead of having just one logo, we had many. And even for the typefaces, we wanted to approach them as branding designers. So um, we added the prefix fair to all of our typefaces. And this also does double duty for us as, you know, while we hope no one will ever use our typeface names, if someone else does release a typeface called Luma, at least ours is called Fair Luma. Um, so it adds a little bit of protection for us. And then it has the added bonus of grouping our fonts together in the font menu. So we've got our fonts. And then we took it a step further and built little brand worlds around each of the fonts. So starting with a color palette and um, typefaces that were in you know, related uh, families like Luma and Luma Reverse, they have related color palettes. And here's the world for Palm. And so for each typeface we make, we also make a set of custom emojis. And we create a sort of theme for each typeface, Palm has like a beachy vibe. And we make emojis in the theme. So for Palm, we have these tropical flowers. And for the specimen words, we chose uh, famous beaches around the world. And one thing consistent about all our fonts is no matter the emoji set, there's always Finn in the dog emoji spot. <laughs> So this is how it all came together. Um, for the homepage, when you arrived, we wanted variable fonts to be front and center and to encourage people to play a little with the font. So you have this nice mouse over feature that changes the font based on the access. And for the whole site, I have to shout out our amazing developer, Dylan Fisher of the Bud, who was as committed to, as we were to making something really special. And uh, I have here the mobile version. So we wanted, even if you were um, accessing based on, you know, on your phone, that 
it, u it uses <laughs> It uses the um, orientation of your phone to uh, access those, you know, different places in the variable font axis. And something that we always really appreciated on Foundry sites was the ability to quickly test all the typefaces at once to see if it'd be suitable for the project. So we built our fonts page to have this global type tester. Um, and for the UI of the site, so the user interface, we made the decision to keep the controls as minimal and easy to use as possible. We, we didn't want to make it intimidating by having numbers or technical details in the sliders themselves. We wanted the experience of testing the fonts to be really visual. And then if you want that technical info, uh, it's there for you on the left side. Um, so it'll tell you exactly what size the type is, what the weight is, if um, it's slanted, and if it is slanted, what is the angle, or if it's not, if it's italic, um, all those details are available. But the interface is kind of nice and quiet. Then yeah, there's dark mode, light mode, color mode, lots of fun things for designers to play with. And then for the main typeface pages, we tried our best to design something that highlighted the fonts and their special features. So Octav has a lot of beautiful display ligatures. And uh, we have those in a variable font tester at the top of the page. And then um, when you keep scrolling, we have a more detailed type tester where you can type whatever you want and access things like open type features. So you see here, I'm going to turn on a uh, K swoosh and an R swoosh. And then if you keep going down the page, there's also um, paragraph type testers where you can select uh, you know, a, a word, a phrase, whatever you need, and see how the different styles, the different weights, uh, react together. You can also play with the tracking and the letting. And then we have a glyph viewer where you can see um, any glyph that you'd like to see. You can see it in big. Um, and this also serves the purpose of visually showing you what the character set is for each typeface. So before you even get trial fonts or look, you know, if you don't have to look much deeper, you can see all of the characters that are in the typeface, including uh, all the emojis. And then we have this little emoji moment at the bottom of the page. And then trial fonts. So trial fonts are exactly what they say. They are free trials for you to download to test the fonts in your design to see if they're suitable before you license the fonts. So this was something that we wanted to make sure was also really easily accessible on our site because we've been on the other end as designers like a million times searching websites for trial fonts. Um, and uh, something that we decided to do with our trial fonts was to include the full character set. So a lot of foundries will subset the character set. So maybe it's just A through Z, 0 through 9, and basic punctuation. And the reason they do this is so that you can't just use the trial fonts in your final project because you're missing characters. Um, but my partner, Maxime, is French. And it didn't seem fair to us that uh, we should make it harder for people who have accented characters in their language. So if we support your language, it made sense that you should be able to fully test our fonts. Uh, so we decided against any sort of subsetting and are instead just choosing to trust people to license the fonts if they use them in your final project. And here's the interface for the process of uh, purchasing a font. So we made it as seamless as we could. Um, and something we challenged our amazing developer with was uh, these stacking discounts that we were really set on. Because as designers, we know that uh, you know you don't just need one style of a font. Usually, you need a couple, maybe the regular and the bold. Maybe you need the italics, too. Uh, or maybe you need a lot of styles for you know flexibility. So if you buy one font, it's full price. If you buy two, 15% off. Buy three, 20% off. 
and it keeps going until if you buy the whole family, you save uh, 55%. And this is just like another fun way where we're kind of reinforcing those uh, like mini brand world colors, you know, the color palette for each typeface in this purchasing page. So after all this stuff, um, we had to figure out how to tell people we exist. Uh, so we called up our friend Cassidy Van Dyke, who started making really interesting 3D stuff, uh, and asked her if she'd be interested in working with us on a project to announce our launch. And our vision with the Type Foundry, like before we had even you know, started working on our catalog, but you know, we had this idea we wanted to make a Type Foundry because we also really wanted to connect more with our design community. As graphic designers, it's pretty much us and our clients, which is a rewarding uh, relationship for sure. But um, you know, we don't get to work with other designers too often. But as type designers, we're making tools for our design community. So one of the goals from the beginning was to collaborate as much as possible with people who we admire. So now I'm going to show you uh, the short video that we made with Cass. She did such a great job with these renders and with the video. It came out really beautifully, and it was so helpful for us in ways that when we started this project, we didn't even anticipate. When it came time to make case studies for our typefaces, we were able to use these 3D renders to showcase the type in unexpected ways. When bounty hunters approached us about having a spread in their book, we were able to use the graphics Cass made us uh, to make our spread more interesting. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, continuing a self-driven design practice. So the process of building the Type Foundry reminded me how much I like learning new things. I took so many classes during the process to learn how to draw type, how to engineer type, how to write EULAs. Uh, and since then, that train is, you know, since that train has gotten into motion, uh, I've just kept going. So in the spring of this year, I took an augmented reality class with the online school type electives. So here's a 2D sketch for an idea that I had. And here's the finished piece in AR. So when the camera recognizes the postcard design, flowers start appearing. And the flowers are palm emojis from our typeface palm that I extruded and mapped with the texture. And this is another AR project that was really fun. Uh, it's a modular type piece of New York City. And when the letters rotate, it goes from being square letters with no contrast, meaning uh, the thicks and thins of the letters are the same, to letters with contrast. And I was able to have object occlusion for this one, so it recognizes if something's in front of it. So I just had some fun placing this around the city. And then this is a face filter I was experimenting with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to create a filter to show who designed the different typefaces in our catalog, but of course, also the dog. <laughs> And then this is a fun project I did over the summer while I was in France. Uh, I took a three-day stone carving workshop in a small village. And so here you can see on the far left my sketch, which I then digitized and traced, uh, digitized and printed. And that's in the middle, and then I traced it. And then I carved it into stone. So um, it's a lettering piece of the word "été," which means summer in French. This took a really long time. Uh, and I like the idea of being of summer being golden, and because I'm extra, I gold foiled it. And then since I spent the summer on a horse farm, I had to show it to my little horse friend who tried to eat it. <laughs> and then when he couldn't eat it, he tried to break it. Um, 
And then of course, again, because I'm extra, I had to make it into AR. And here's the AR alone in the south of France. So after launch, what's next? How do we keep going? Um, we've continued to build our catalog over the past nine months. Our first new release after launch was Sprig Sands Mono, which is a monospaced version of Sprig Sands. And this was, again, because I really love these letter forms, but also when I was thinking about our catalog, um, I felt that you know we could use a monospace typeface, and it just kind of all came together. And then our biggest new, new release, which is coming this month, in a few days, weeks, not sure, um, it's an experimental typeface that emphasizes how letters are constructed digitally. And again, we got to work with one of our good friends, uh, James Linehan, who created this campaign video for us, which I'm going to show you. We're obsessed with it. Um, we worked with him in a way, too, this time, where um, the video can work both horizontal and vertically. So it looks good on mobile when the left and right sides are cropped out, but we can also still show it on um, very soon. I just really wanted to show you guys. Um, so this is the type, type family. And it does some fun stuff. Uh, the variable font does some fun stuff. It has a really crazy width axis. We made some family merch for my brother's uh, station. And then the last thing I wanted to share before I wrap this up was just how unbelievably exciting it's been and rewarding it's been to see people using our fonts uh, since we launched earlier this year. Uh, one of the most unreal uses for me so, so far was the Brooklyn Museum used my typefaces Sprig and Sprig Sands for the ex their exhibition about French fashion designer Thierry Mugler. And I grew up in Brooklyn riding the Q train to go to school and to see my typeface on the banner in front of the Brooklyn Museum and in the subway was just like the craziest feeling. But really, truly, like every time something comes out that uses our fonts, it's so exciting for us and makes us feel that connection to the design community. And we can't wait to see what else people make with our type. Thank you. <laughs> so much Sabrina so we wanted to open the floor for questions don't be shy <laughs> Oh, uh, so for one of the type, the type, I think it was like the moving blocks one for the NYC thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering like what you used to like create the 3D aspect and then how you like transferred it into the AR. Sure, part. yeah. Uh, so I created it in Blender, which is a free 3D software. And uh, in Blender, I made the animation and the forms. And then I used Apple's AR kit to, um, to, to turn it into the AR experience that you saw. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um. Hi. Um, just based off the um, whole presentation, it just seems like each type took so much time to like make and so much effort to make. And especially with like long projects, I feel like personally, and I'm sure everybody around like feels so tired and like loses that initial source of like inspiration. So like, how do you keep like going, and how do you like make sure to finish a project um, that you like once started? It's really hard. It's a grind for sure. Um, I think it helps. What helps for me at least is the type is like a tool that I'm making and. It's nice when I can apply it to a project that I'm working on. So 
um, if I'm doing a branding project, maybe I'll try to sneak it in as one of the options I'm going to share with the client. And then that gets me excited. That'll like kind of give me another boost to keep going. Um, but if I come across a really nice reference, like a piece of inspiration, that's like another thing that can give me a little bit of a boost. But otherwise, it's it's hard. It takes a long time to make a typeface, too, for that reason, because uh, I don't think anybody has the stamina to just work on it every single day. You know, we, we pick it up, we put it down, we work on something else to give our brains a break. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's a marathon and there's just, you gotta find little strategies that like make you excited to keep going. That helps. Mm -hmm. Hello, Hi. I loved your presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, I just want to ask, um, do you plan in the future on hosting other type designers work on your foundry or is it strictly your work? Yeah, for sure. That's like part of the community aspect that we wanted to open up. Um, I don't think we'll ever be like a real marketplace where anybody can just put the work, but we'd love to have like meaningful collaborations with other type designers. Um, we are like always thinking about the curation of our catalog and making sure that it represents who we are and our vision artistically. Um, so there's that kind of curation factor that's part of it. But yeah, we absolutely would love to host other type designers on our foundry. And we actually um, have our first potential collaboration that we just started. So we're gonna see, we're gonna try to help her through that kind of grind, you know, give her, you know, the help and the support that she needs to finish her typeface if she'd like to release it with us. Um, I think this was like a grand project and I really like it. I was wondering like how long did it took from like start to finish, like where you had the idea for this like website and project until like you consider it finished like a full product? Sure, yeah. I'd say like we had been talking about making a type foundry for like six or seven years. So it's always been in the back of our minds that we'd want to do it. Um, from the time that we went to type at Cooper to when we launched was, I believe, four years. So um, that's, that's including the time it took for us to really learn our craft well enough that we felt comfortable to release work. Um, and then the time it took for our website, like the design to launch of the website was a full year. Um, but part of that was the, the really hard work of our developer too, um, and us doing things kind of behind the scenes. But yeah, kind of like six years overall, four years since education, and then one, one full year for the, the site. Um, and just like an extension to that question, how many people like did it take in general? Ooh, I mean, a lot because uh, you know our wonderful friends. We we you know we sat our friends Lynn and Kevin through an entire presentation of our website and made them like, do you like this? Does this make sense? Uh, we showed so many people, uh, you know, other designers our site before we you know approached a developer, and then um, our developer was such a huge part of the process. Also, Dylan really helped us. Uh, you know, he had a a really good eye and um, we, we appreciated his advice so much. And then all the people that taught us things like how to engineer type. And I'd also like to say that like the other, like the type community in general is so welcoming and so supportive that I, I've called on the phone other type foundries and asked them questions like, you know, kind of really intimate business questions and they've shared their responses and without like batting an eye. So um, I'd say the whole community <laughs> really helped. Um, but in terms of like people that uh, worked on it, it was really myself, uh, my partner Maxime, our developer Dylan, and then the people that made uh, the 3D work for us, Cassidy and uh, James. That's kind of the, the, the core team, but really everybody, the whole community really helped a lot. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Hi. It's such a beautiful slide that you made. I wonder what kind of software did you use for making the slides? Ooh, simple answer. InDesign. <laughs> InDesign can make like animations in it as well. Uh, no, so everything, everything that's still, I made it in InDesign. Um, the motion graphics, uh, the few motion graphics that you saw, I made in After Effects. Um, this GIF is from After Effects, and this is the only little uh, keynote animation that I threw in there. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Any last questions? Uh, I had uh, one more question. Uh, so for some of um, your works, like the typeface and like insanely clean or like the people's beauty, I was wondering um, when you were making the type, did you think about just um, designing like only the letters for, for that, uh, are, uh, that are like given to you? Or did you think about like creating the whole like alphabet list? No, when we're making a logo, we're really thinking about just the letters that are in the in the logo type that we have to, to work with. And th that allows us the ability to get really creative with how the letters uh, work next to each other versus when we're making a typeface. And really rarely, but sometimes uh, when we make a logo afterwards, we're like, these letters can work with all the other letters. And that's what happened with Mirlo. But most often, it's just the logo type is kind of, we're just looking at the letters that were given and seeing how they really, you know, work together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in when you were kind of looking at a lot of the typefaces in the beginning, and then you narrowed down on four. Um, and I also heard you mention that when you were designing your website, you asked for feedback uh, quite often and with a lot of people. Um, I had two questions. The first was, um, when narrowing in on those four typefaces, did you do sort of like a round of exercises with peers or, or other folks? Um, and then the second question is, when you get down to actually like testing the, the typeface to see how it relates, like how the characters relate to one another, uh, you know, what sort of strategies do you use to make sure that they all kind of play ball uh, fairly with one another? Yeah, those are two good questions. Um, so the first one was if we asked other people. I think I think the curation, we really wanted it to be something that came from us to decide uh, what represented us. And I think that there's some typefaces that uh, we'll probably still go back to because there's a lot of good ideas there. But um, for our launch, we wanted it to be really tight and really, like, you know, well formed um, and then for reviewing a typeface uh, so we do what's called proofing a typeface and uh, we have designed several hundred page documents that uh, we like as soon as we start designing pretty quickly after we get a, f a couple of characters in we start looking at them in proof format where we're looking at them uh, in sentences in paragraphs um, because if you're just looking at the letters themselves, you can make like the world's most beautiful A and then the world's most beautiful G and then the world's most beautiful S, but then they look terrible together. Um, so it's, it's tricky. And even when we design, uh, we, d we draw type inside of glyphs and you can write out a word and design your type, like design one letter inside of the context of a word. And so that's really helpful. Um, but yeah, we're always looking at it we're always looking at type in context. Okay. Well, thank you so much, um, Sabrina. That was awesome. So, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>